Hello and welcome to uh, another news episode of Fully Charged. Uh, before I start, I just want to do a quick few thank yous to some really spectacular uh, Patreon supporters. Isabel Luengas, Jean-Paul Breen, Sophie and Lucy Conway and Adam Battleaxe. Here we go. Thank you very much, guys. But anyway, hello and welcome. And what a crazy time it has been in the last few weeks as regards news related to electric cars and renewable energy and battery storage and all kinds of things. Amazing stuff going on. We're going to make an episode in the next few days with Johnny Smith, which is going to focus very specifically on electric cars because there's so much news about that. Volvo, uh, just to start it off with. I actually went on Sky News like a proper pundit to talk about the Volvo uh, announcement. I didn't, they didn't use much, they used a little bit, that's all. So this is literally a handful of uh, stories that I've picked up over the last few weeks, uh, which really indicates the speed, the scale, and the impact of these changes, the, uh, the changes that are happening all around the world, and it's happening at a far greater uh, speed than anyone predicted. For a start, the Queen's speech. Those of you in the UK will know what that is. That's when the, the current government announces its plans and policies for the coming uh, parliament. OK, it's a bit of a wibbly-wobbly government. It's not exactly clear who's quite in control, uh, but, you know, whatever. They did do a Queen's speech. Well, the Queen gave the Queen's speech. Didn't dress up much for it. It was a bit casual, a bit off the cuff. She would rather have been at the horse racing, which is fine, and I don't blame her. But there was a bit of a surprise amongst the usual tosh, mainly in relationship to the uh, encouragement to the uptake of electric cars. The key thing for me was a, a statement by the government that they will enact legislation that will make it mandatory for electric car users to have one thing, one card, one app, one dongle that will allow them to access all the public charging network. Can you imagine that? I mean, I've got a wallet full of cards and I've got a phone full of apps so I can use all the different charging networks and all that stuff. And it is a right pain. It's going to put a lot of people off driving electric cars and I don't blame them. I mean, who wants to go through all that? I want one thing, one thing. And you go up to any charger and you go blip or you go dip or you go sib or whatever you do. And you, I pay for it. I'm not worried about paying for it. I'm worried about being able to access it without any hassle at all. And that's really, really good news that they're going to implement that. Then there's the Faraday Challenge. Yeah, I hadn't heard of it either. Well, the Faraday Challenge is a project that the government are supporting. Uh, it will receive a £246 million research grant specifically targeted at developing uh, large-scale battery storage, car batteries, Batteries. It's all about batteries. Now, the UK could be a leader in this field. <laughs> Sorry, I shouldn't be saying that while I'm laughing. I'll go do that better. I'll be more serious. The UK could be a leader in this field. Well, you know, we've been very good at discovering amazing things. The lithium ion battery was discovered just down the road in Oxford. What did we do with it? We sort of gave it to Sony and then they did some stuff with cameras. <laughs> Who's interested? <laughs> So, uh, you know, this is a really good bit of legislation. It's very forward thinking. And uh, currently, as the president of the USA is slashing all the American government sponsored R&D funding, there's quite a lot of very, very clever, very talented researchers looking for a new home. So this does seem like very appropriate timing to start spending money on R&D in this particular and very rapidly growing area. I mean, we don't want to get left behind as we always have done with these new technologies. It would be really good if this country invests big time in this emerging technology, uh, you know, to make sure we're ahead of the field. OK, not ahead, but just keeping up at least. That would be good. Now, on a side note, I'm currently working on a big episode about the Tesla Powerwall. That's the uh, where all the lights and the cameras and everything in this studio are being powered from. None of this is coming from the National Grid. It's all coming from the power wall and the solar panels on the roof of this building. But I want to wait a little bit of time so that I've got enough data to show what it's like to have a Tesla power wall and solar panels on your house for like a month. I want to see how much the electricity bill is reduced, how much of the electricity we're using comes from the grid and how much comes from the, the panels and the power wall. And that's going to take a little bit of time. Currently, today, just to give you an idea, we're 89% powered by the solar panels and the battery, which is kind of quite a lot, isn't it? Now, talking of houses running off batteries, there's been a lot of talk over the last few years about running your house from your electric car. Vehicle-to-grid technologies allow you to charge your car's battery and also take power from it when you need it. Now, just to allay the obvious fears, now just imagine that you've got an electric car, it's parked at your house, it's plugged in, 
it charges overnight while you're asleep and then when you wake up in the morning along with everybody else in the country and you turn on the kettle the toaster the oven you have a shower you have the heating and lights on all those things they all they, there's a very big uh, uh, rise in demand at that time well if each electric car were to donate very small amount one or two percent of its complete of its total capacity into the national grid one car wouldn't make any difference a thousand cars wouldn't make any difference a million cars makes a massive huge totally game-changing colossal difference so they would be donating a little bit of their power that would reduce the overall demand we wouldn't have to turn on gas uh, burning power stations we wouldn't be, uh, we wouldn't need an extra hinkley point c we'd have that energy stored from overnight from wind possibly from nuclear but from very cheap electricity and we can use it in the daytime so basically you're not going to wake up and find that your car's empty because the national grid has nicked all your electricity now that may sound like a no-brainer but i've heard serious concerns that uh, doing this may actually damage the car's battery in fact it may invalidate the warranty and that's why I love engineers you see I heard that and went oh dear oh that's a big problem oh god forget it then let's do something else whereas an engineer heard the same thing and went oh really oh let's try and find out at the University of Warwick which is just up the road from me uh, they have shown that the intelligent use of vehicle to grid or V to G technology can actually improve the battery life of electric vehicles by up to 12% a year that's ridiculous potentially disproving a key criticism of the technology now what they discovered over a two-year study is that not only do vehicle to grid systems work I mean they're actually running their research laboratories from a collection of electric cars parked on the campus but the process actually improves battery life now until now the general consensus has been that increased cycles that is charging the vehicle and discharging it which would be imposed on a battery using V to G technology uh, would lead to more rapid degradation. That's what people assumed. However, the new study suggests that this process is more complex than thought, thought of, and in fact, it can be exploited to improve the battery's lifetime. Now, if you want to find out more, because this is quite a complex area, there are links to all these stories beneath the video. Now, a couple of weeks ago, when we were having something that was vaguely akin to an actual summer in the United Kingdom, uh, the mayor of London, Sadiq Khan, triggered the capital's emergency air quality alert. Now, researchers said that the toxic air was caused by high ozone levels brought up from industrial parts of France by a southerly wind. Yeah, you see, it's all, it's all, it's all the fault of Europe. Sorry, I'm just sorry. They also warned that particulate levels, particularly from motor vehicles and other fuel burning, were adding to the toxic stew. How lovely. Nitrogen dioxide emissions, mostly from diesel cars, caused 23,500 of the 40,000 premature deaths from air pollution each year. That's quite bad, isn't it, really? And that's according to the government's own data. So that's pretty depressing. But on the flip side, how about getting paid to use electricity? Now, previously, I'd only ever heard of this happening in Germany and Denmark, but now it's happening in the United Kingdom. A couple of weeks ago, the wholesale price of electricity went negative for the first time in the UK. What? A wholesale price going negative? I mean, that doesn't make sense. How can that happen? Well, a blustery start to the summer has helped the renewable energy industry to its highest ever output as wind turbines and solar panels help meet more than half of the UK's electricity demand. More than half. That's more than 50%. Do you know, when I started making fully charged, it was averaging at 2%. The National Grid's data at lunchtime on Wednesday the 14th of June show that solar panels produced around 7.6 gigawatts, while wind farms generated 9.5 gigawatts. This huge amount of power caused market prices to fall into negative territory in the early hours of the morning and prompted the national grid to make payments to major energy users to use more power so the grid wasn't overwhelmed by supply. This is the first summer in which the national grid has used the so-called demand turn-up scheme. Now, this is a scheme to pay six successful businesses who were selected through an auction to use the grid's excess supply rather than pay energy companies to stop generating. OK, so this is six big factories. It could be a big car factory, a, a big shipyard or a steelworks or something or an oil refinery. They use a lot of electricity. They get paid to use that electricity because that is cheaper than turning off 
big generating plants like gas plants. You can't turn nuclear off, gas and coal. That costs us money. We have to pay for that. That's called a subsidy. Just quickly saying that, just getting that in there. But what this did is actually save money. It's cheaper to do that. A National Grid spokesman said its figures show it will save consumers £500,000 over the summer. I mean, that's not much when you're talking millions of pounds, but it's still better than it costing us. And finally, OK, I have a Tesla Powerwall in this house, show coming soon, but South Australia is about to get a seriously big Powerwall. This is the Tesla grid battery that Elon Musk said he would install within 100 days or the South Australian government wouldn't have to pay for it. The system is a 129 megawatt hour battery situated at the Hornsdale Wind Farm, which is a couple of hours drive outside Adelaide. Now, the Tesla grid battery I saw in California when I was filming there with the BBC was 80 megawatt hours. And this one is 129 megawatt hours. And no doubt the next one we see will be over 200 megawatt hours. Yes, they're getting bigger and they're getting cheaper. As my pal Simon Hackett said in a newspaper article on this subject, this big battery project sets South Australia up as a world leader in the use of battery storage with renewable energy. A true signpost to the future of the world. Mate, very proud to know you. I predict we're going to see more and more grid level batteries being installed around the world. In fact, we're going to go and see a very big grid level battery in the UK very soon on fully charged. So things really are changing and they're changing really fast. And as I always say, disruptive technologies are never 100 percent positive. There will always be unforeseen side effects. No technology that the human race makes is ever clean. It's never green. They always require raw materials and everything we do, everything we do has an impact on the environment. But what we're seeing is the changes that I've been dreaming about for a long time. The basic underlying drive that the more far-sighted and long-term thinking people of the world are striving for. To develop technologies that don't require us to burn so much stuff. We, the human race, have been burning stuff since we first started living in caves. We've always burnt stuff and burning stuff has been amazing. It's allowed us to develop as, as, a, as a species and to develop all the technologies we have now. What we've burnt in the past has been brilliant. We love burning stuff. We've always been burning stuff. Everyone loves a bonfire. But now we understand that burning stuff is basically not sustainable and it's not terribly good for the planet. So the sooner we stop burning as much as we are now, the better. Now, I, am, I absolutely accept that we're always going to be burning something. I've got logs in my garage. Don't, yeah, I'm, not, I'm not preaching from some high mountain. I'm preaching from a, the gutter. Those logs are very old. A lot of people commented on my logs. Tesla Powerwall and logs. I'll just quickly say Patreon and subscribe. Can't be bothered to go on about it. And as always, if you have been, thank you for watching.